But today we have finished up uh, Genesis chapter 50, all of Genesis last week. And so this is the first sermon in our new series in the book, The Acts of the Apostles. And so this is going to be a good overview sermon, but we're going to get into chapter 1 a little bit. And so I want you to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read a little bit from Luke 24. You'll find out why in just a minute. But we see that in Acts, it's interesting because I was super old when I realized that Acts meant the Acts of the Apostles. So what the Apostles did, what they did, how they acted. I mean, I was really old when I figured that out. I was like, I feel like I'm not even qualified to say things anymore. It wasn't while I've been here, okay? I understood it before I got here, but it was out of high school for sure. And it dawned on me, it's what they were doing. That makes so much sense. So to make sure you never go a day more without knowing that, the acts of the apostles means what they did, how they acted during this time, okay? Yes, that should be quite obvious, but it was not. And so the Acts of the Apostles is a turning point in the biblical narrative. It's a huge turning point. There's three, well, let's say there's four main ones. Uh, but there is the Old Testament, Genesis to the Savior. Okay, Genesis to the Messiah. Being in Genesis, people fell into sin. Adam needed to be redeemed. We needed to be redeemed. And from the immediate, the first conversation that God has, he starts to say, hey, uh, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Immediately, the first conversation God has after Adam and Eve fell into sin, there was a plan already in place. And so Genesis to Malachi is that plan unraveling, yet never 100%, not fully being realized. And then when Christ came, the fulfillment, the fullness of all of the prophecies, all of the details, all the nuances even of the Old Testament, all of a sudden came into sight. And so what Acts does, though, the Gospels, we have them in the Gospels. So there's the Old Testament, then we have the Gospels. And then, now there's more breakdowns, but this is my general idea. And then Acts, what it does, it starts the progression of the church. What did Christ do? That Christ, that is the Messiah of the Old Testament. We have the Gospels now. The Messiah has come. In, in a moment, he is going to be ascended into the hand, right hand of majesty upon high. Chapter 7, Daniel. And then we see that the church just starts. And the church starts in an odd way, some. Um, we're going to see it progressively go through. But what's interesting about the book of Acts is it takes a, uh, several years, actually, to get through it as far as their time frame. I mean, it was like 40 to 50 years worth of information summed up into a book. But to understand the book, you need to know just a few things, okay? We know the author of Acts is Luke, the physician. Whenever you see Luke in the Bible, there's technically two Lukes. Uh, the other Luke is named by a different name sometimes uh, because of the way the Greek works. But Luke, the physician, is the Luke we're talking about. He also wrote the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Now, Luke being a physician, he has a very different way that he goes about writing the Gospels. Matthew is an Orthodox Jewish person that was called out by Christ to go follow him. Matthew writes his Gospel to the Jewish people of his day. That's why it starts immediately off with a genealogy. If the Messiah didn't come from a certain genealogy, they would throw that guy out altogether. And so Matthew knew he needed to really start there. Mark was our earliest gospel that we have. Mark was about 10 years before the other gospels even started to be written down. Okay? Now, Mark is the shortest one. However, it's the most concise one, obviously. And we know through parallel passages that Luke used the gospel of Mark to get a rough draft. And then Luke went back to a lot of the people that were in the story. And then he expands on the story. That's why when you read the book of Luke... And you read Mark side by side, they almost have quotes from each other. Well, Luke is actually quoting Mark, but what Luke does is he wants to expand it out to the majority, the most that he can, that he feels relevant. And so that's why, like in Mark, 
You start off with John the Baptist preaching at the uh, river. And yet, in Luke, you start off with John being foretold to be born. We're not even talking about Jesus yet. We're talking about John foretold to be born, then Jesus told to be born, and a whole bunch of stuff. So Luke is an expanded version of basically what the book of Mark is. Now John, when John wrote his gospel, he wrote it from a very different perspective all together. So Matthew, Mark, Luke are considered what we call the synoptic gospels. They are similar in how they're written, although they're not written to the same people group, they're, they're written narratively in the same way. But if you look at the first few verses of the book, the gospel of John, it doesn't start off really in a very narrative way. He starts off by talking uh, in this ethereal thing, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word is God, and in the beginning all things were created, and it's, it's just very different how John writes his gospel. But when we look at the book of Luke, we know the Luke, the physician Luke, one thing that makes it interesting of why he wrote Acts is because Luke traveled with Paul the Apostle for most of his ministry, as far as we can tell. He also traveled with Barnabas a little bit, but Luke was basically a behind-the-scenes guy letting Paul and Barnabas and Apollos, all those people, doing their thing, and he's just keeping a record of everything that's going on. And he's making sure to write down details, and he sums it all up. Now, as a physician, here's the thing. He's probably a little smarter than the fishermen out there. Not in everything, not in fishing probably, but he has an intellect that's going to take in details that he feels like are, are pretty important. And that's why you could start someone off with the book of John, Luke, Matthew, Mark, however, you want to give them a really big full picture. Luke really does that, I think, the best. And so what we see from Luke, he writes... Uh, also the book of Acts, we see him in Colossians 4.14. Luke has talked about um, the beloved physician greets you, as does Demas. 2 Timothy 4.11, Luke alone is with me. This is Paul talking all these times. Philemon 24, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. We see, and we know that Colossians 2 Timothy and Philemon is written like within 20 years of each other. So a lot of time is passing and Luke is just keep on showing up. And so we appreciate Luke for what he did. Now, what's interesting, we do not know who exactly the person is that Luke wrote the book to. We know his name, but we don't really know anything else about him. There's been a lot of research. There's a ton of people by the name of Theophilus. Theophilus is a guy in Luke chapter 1 verse 1 says inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us it seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus that you may have certainly, uh, certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now what's interesting, Luke tells you why he's writing it. He's like, hey, I know some other people have written it, but I also have been following everything very closely. I have a whole bunch of notes, and so I feel like I should write all this down and organize it in an orderly fashion. That's why if you read the book of Luke, it is the most boom, 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 boom. It's just very structured because of how he wrote it. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the book, the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he has, was taken up after he had given commands to the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And so he starts the book of Acts off with a reference back to the first book of Theophilus that I wrote to you. Now what's weird is we don't know who Theophilus was and it was a super common name or variations of the name are super common. And so tracking him down in history to this day, we still have not been able to. We don't know if he was another physician Clearly, he had something connected to Christianity, but we don't even know where the letter was sent to. 
Because the gospel and that book of Acts were written so much later, as far as like after the events had happened, they, it was distributed, that no one could track back down who Theophilus was. It was just distributed, and when it would go into a church, they would copy the book, and they had a method the way they did it, and then they would take that letter. It was not a book. It was a letter back then. But they would take the letter, and they would take it to the next town over and hand it off to the church that was there. They would write it down. They would take it over. They would write it down. It would keep on going. And so two or three churches in, you wouldn't even know where it came from. Oh, well, we got it from Thessalonica. Well, where did you get it from? Well, we got it from Colossae. Well, where did you get it from? Well, we had actually to steal it because uh, the Romans came in. We had to bury it. And then we told someone to go get it. And he, I don't know where he was from. And so that's how letters actually came into being. Now, as a whole, not completed documents, but as a whole for the New Testament, we have over 24,000 parchments of documents that are the New Testament written in ancient times. And so uh, the closest next one is we have the Iliad. The Iliad is the second closest amount of copies that we have uh, from ancient times. And it's at around 2,000. So if you compare how much more copies we have, what's wild is about 12,000 of them we only found in the 1960s. But we can date them, we can look at the ink, we can look at the strokes, we can look at the way the languages work, and we know that they're actually probably the oldest ones that we have older than we've been using up till the 1960s. So it's a wealth of knowledge that we've been able to find. And so, but in the dating of it, it's a little weird because we don't exactly know the dating, we know about the time. Uh, however, there is no mention of Paul's death. And if Luke was traveling with Paul and Paul died, he probably would have put it in his letter. That would make sense. Okay, not, not perfect, but it would make sense. He doesn't do that. And he also doesn't talk anything about Nero's persecution. And Nero's persecution affected the world, the known world. It was not isolated. It was horrific. And uh, we know Nero's persecution happened, abrupt, happened abruptly and immediately and just staggered the world in A.D. 65. And so we know it had to be before A.D. 65. But we know the book of Mark was written about A.D. 50. And so if he used the book of Mark, it has to be finished first. So about A.D. 50 to A.D. 65 is kind of when the book, the, the Luke, and then somewhere in Acts shows up. So... Very interesting stuff. But the theme, the early church coming to life by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's as concise as I can make it. The early church coming to life by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Now, we begin Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, and I'll go to Acts in just a minute. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be filled. Luke is quoting Jesus right now. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance from the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands. He blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So this is the very end of the book of Luke. Acts being his second book, it's very important to know what he just said. And we see the most, one of the most important things in the Old Testament, it is told that eventually the Holy Spirit would come. Joel chapter 2, we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. But in Joel chapter 2, uh, we're given the most detailed account of the Holy Spirit coming. However, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit will come several times other than just this occasion. We see that in John chapter 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
Eventually this happens at the day of Pentecost. John 14, 25 says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And then in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin. Because they do not believe in me. And on down to verse 13, it says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And in Romans 8, 7, it says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So guess what? The Holy Spirit is super important, okay? Without the Holy Spirit, the church cannot be in existence, okay? Now, the church followers definitely started, and the church was a beginning while Christ was with us. However, there's a huge, huge obstacle that occurs, most of us never realize. Okay? Because here's the thing. The Holy Spirit comes. He empowers us. We love the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit actually does something first before the empowerment that is just as important. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail about it next week. However, I did want to let you know. Here's the thing. God cannot abide with sin. Correct? I'm going to quote you that scripture next week. God can't abide with sin. God cannot be in a certain proximity to us because of our sinful nature. Well, we've already talked about it about three years ago. <laughs> that what the old covenant, the sacrifices at the temple did, what did they do? That word for atone in the Old Testament means to cover up. But John the Baptist says something very unique about what Jesus does. He says he doesn't cover up. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Those are two completely different things, biblically speaking. You can have your sins covered up by the law and the sacrifices. But Jesus comes and he actually takes away the sins and then replaces it with something. What does he replace it with? Righteousness. He not only takes away the sin, that's the first step, but we needed something else to go before God. Okay? Sin being taken away from us allows us not to die for eternity. But Christ giving us his righteousness allows us to go before the glory of God. So why is it that the Holy Spirit has come? This is a significant sign because... In the Old Testament, although God worked with his people, he could not dwell with his people because their sins were only covered up and God cannot abide with sin. He won't abide with sin. But lo and behold, Jesus comes. He takes away our sins. Now, guess what God can do? He can abide with us. Now, God in his full glory cannot abide with us. That would destroy the universe, okay? But however, Jesus cannot abide in that way because he's physically something. And so, so what happens? The third person of the Trinity is just right for what needs to happen next. We believe in a triune God. He's one God, but in three different persons. You say, well, Pastor Blake, that don't make sense. I know it doesn't because you're not a triune being. God is a different kind of being than we are. Not even angels are like that, okay? Angels seem to be more powerful and cool than us. However, they're not even God themselves. God exists simultaneously in three personhoods, but he's still just one God. All of them connected, yet can separately be used for doing things. It's what? God the Father we sinned against. God the Son puts the sacrifice for sin and the Holy Spirit seals us until the day of redemption. And so what the Holy Spirit does is that is the person of God, that person of God, not version, not mode, not thing. 
He, the Holy Spirit, comes into us and dwells in us because now your sin has been taken away from you and God can now abide with you. And so whenever you get up to heaven, that's why God says, well, what about this sin that you did back then? What about this sin you did back then? But Satan probably will do that anyway. But God will say, hey, I don't see a sinner. I see myself. I see my own righteousness before me. Well done, good and faithful servant. And at that point, we will enter into an eternity of peace. But because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, there's no sin anymore upon us. We will be, we will enter into a perfect state. What does God require to be before him? Perfection. Well, God fixes our imperfect problem and makes us perfect again. Not this side of heaven. He's working on us right now. But when we enter in, all sin is 100% not able to affect us anymore. And we enter into eternity in perfect perfection. And we can stand and behold the glory of God. Now, in the end, we know at Judgment Day, it says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that the Lord is God. Every one of them. That's the, the, the sinners, the, the uh, Christians alike. However, the Christians, we will go before God and say, you are king of kings and Lord of lords. We're going to do that willingly. If you do not have Christ, you will be under the weight of the glory of God in his wrath. And you will still be made to say it. And he will say, I never knew you. And yet you will still have to proclaim him as Lord, as glorious, powerful, and true. But here's good news. We don't have to worry about that. Because we have Christ who redeemed us from our sin, who took our sin away, gave us his righteousness, filled us with his spirit. That is a helper. He's teaching us all things. He's convicting the world of sin. Guess who's also in the world? Us. He's convicting us of sin as we discover things in our life that shouldn't be there. He convicts us and we repent and we take it off and we continue following him. And there's a sign that if anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. You're not a part of the body if you do not have the spirit of Christ. And the spirit of Christ does these things constantly. He constantly convicts us of sin. He constantly is our helper. He constantly teaches us things. And so some of the things that you can say, well, well, how do I know I'm a Christian? Well, you look, are these things happening to you on a regular basis? Are you thinking about, Lord, how can I grow? Lord, who am I in front of you? How can I grow? How can I be sharper? How can I see more of you and your goodness and your grace? And what can I learn from your word? What can I pray? And how can I see you? Those things are natural to someone who has the spirit of God within them. That's why Romans is helping us out. Look, the spirit of God is your mind set on the flesh or is your mind set on the spirit and how good he is and what he wants you to do, your plans and purposes, hey, for your life, God may have something else. How can we look at that? And so we see that the Holy Spirit comes. And then in Acts chapter one, verse one, it says in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up and after he had command through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, 
But you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. We see that uh, he actually appeared to them for 40 days after he was resurrected on the third day. Now, the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. We'll get into that in just a moment. But the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost 50 days after Jesus resurrects from the dead. Okay? Now, there's reasons for that, but just keep that in your mind. There's a 50-day window from Christ dying and resurrecting. And then there's a 50-day span from when Jesus ascends for the very last time. And we never physically see him again until he's going to come back again. Who knows when? Okay? And then the Holy Spirit comes on that time. 50 days. Resurrection. Holy Spirit coming. There's 50 days. 40 of the days, he hung out with them like every single day. Three days was while he was in the grave. And that could start the 40 or 50. But there's only really 10 days that Jesus was without them. Now, some of the reason for the 10 days, some of them had scattered for a little while because of different festivals that were going on. But it did take a few days for some of them to get back to Jerusalem, which he's telling them, hey, go to Jerusalem and just stay there. There's also a festival going on at this time, which is some of the reasons why they're going to be in Jerusalem anyway. And so basically they had 10 days of where they didn't hear from God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, or nothing. But he said, look, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit in just a few days from now. Stay in Jerusalem. Stay put. And if you've ever had kids, you know how easy that is. One is found on the road to Aramaeus. Okay? Not very far, but like three miles away. One is only a mile away in Bethany. One is on the Mount of Olives. That's just right outside the city, but it's up on the mountain. And they're like, just stay. Stay put, okay? Stay there. Don't do anything. Don't talk to anyone. Just stay there. And what they did was they constantly were devoting themselves to prayer. They went to the temple every day. The temple sacrifices and all that process was in transition at this moment from coming out to the church coming in. But it was still going on. So to them, as People that believe in a Jewish Messiah, you would go do the most Jewish thing you could think about, which would be go to the temple. Go to the temple. We're going to pray. We're going to seek God. We're going to stay in Jerusalem. Jesus said the Holy Spirit's coming just a few days from now. Not in a little while, just a few days. So it's got to be quick. For 10 days, they sit there. Now, what's interesting is that they talk to him about a ton of things. He appears to a ton of people. Uh, you go to the next slide. Uh, Hudson. He talks to Mary Magdalene. He talks to Peter. Two disciples on the road to Aramaeus. Ten apostles. Upper room on Easter Sunday morning. Eleven apostles in the upper room. One week later, Thomas being present a different time. Two seven disciples, including Peter, on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. James at some point. We don't know when, but it said that he visited him. Uh, that's the brother of Jesus as well. And uh, to 500 of the brethren at one time on the mountain of Galilee and at the ascension near Bethany. Jesus was super busy for 40 days. Now what he was doing was he was kind of summing up and finishing up the teachings that they needed. Most of the teachings was just, hey, go to Jerusalem. And then he would zap over here. Like, hey, Peter, go to Jerusalem. And he'd go to Thomas. Hey, go to Jerusalem. James, go to Jerusalem. He needed a glorified body because he was jumping everywhere trying to get everyone back to Jerusalem. Like, why did y'all leave? Just come on back. And so they all get back to Jerusalem. And they're all there. And they're devoting themselves to prayer. And you can go back one, uh, Hudson, go back to Acts chapter 1. Now what's interesting is not many days from now. We see not many days from now. Now what's interesting about this is there's certain festivals that God had pre-set up back in the old law, the first five books of the Bible. And God foreshadows what he's going to do later on in the New Testament, actually in this moment. It's amazing. Because right now, uh, well, in uh, Resurrection Sunday is Passover. That's what we celebrate, Passover. Now, to the Jewish people, they're celebrating Passover as when they're in Egypt and the angel of death, whatever it was, passes over them by the blood of the lamb on their doorposts right before they leave Egypt. 
And then they leave Egypt and they have a celebration. Every year, Passover is when our resurrection day is. It, well, it's kind of in the middle of it. Uh, Passover is for seven days and, uh, and a day. It's not eight days, seven days and a day from Wednesday to a Thursday. And so they celebrated that just a few weeks ago. Right now, the Jewish people are getting ready for the second festival after Passover. It's a festival called Sukkot. They're getting ready right now because Sukkoth is just in about two weeks from now, and it's another really huge celebration. If you go to Israel, everything will be shut down in about two weeks for about seven days. Nothing will be open. Nothing. You will get no lifeguard help if you go to the sea. You will get no bus transportation. Nothing is open in two weeks for about seven days in Israel in our current time. Well, back then, the same thing happened. They're getting ready for Sukkoth, which means the Feast of Weeks. This is talked about back in the law, several different places. But what Sukkoth is, is the celebration of the 50th day at Passover. Now in Greek, when we say 50th in Greek, guess what the word 50th is? It's Pentecost, or Pentecost delay actually, but we shorten it. Because of our English, we rule the world. Anyway, Pentecost <laughs> is the word 50. Okay? Now, they're celebrating the 50th day of the weeks. And that is what starts harvest for uh, Israel. Harvest, they've already had their plants. You know, way back there, their climate is super different than us. But in a few weeks, how we have in our town the harvest festival... That is basically what the Feast of Weeks is. It's one last celebration before all the farmers are starting to bring in their har harvest. And it's a celebration that, hey, we know we do not have to start earlier because we trust God that we'll celebrate this and then we will start. Now, our harvest festival is not that holy. If you need to get started early, it's fine, okay? <laughs> it's not that holy. However, in Jerusalem, you are not allowed to harvest because it looks as though you do not trust God to wait in a certain moment. And after the Feast of Weeks, after the seven-day celebrated, the long, I don't even want to be, I don't want to be around here for seven days, okay? That is a long time. We're going to need some more food. All of us are going to be rough. We need to go back home. But for seven days, they're going to celebrate. And then after that, the harvest begins. But what's super interesting, okay, I think it's so What's super interesting is you know what the Feast of Weeks also represents to the Jewish people? Do you know why they actually celebrate? They don't celebrate it for harvesting. It's just they use that as a marker for harvesting. The Feast of Weeks is not about harvest. Do you know what the Feast of Weeks is about? It is to celebrate when Moses received the Torah from God. When Moses was up on Mount Sinai, and God wrote with his own finger the Ten Commandments. And then the following week, he was given the first five books of the Bible. And God inspired Moses. He gave him the words to write down, and he wrote it down. I don't know how he did it on the mountain. But he wrote down the Torah and the law, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, the Numbers. And so they're celebrating that they believe that this, in two weeks, 5,000 years ago, I don't know the date, God gave them the Torah. Now, I think what is super, super interesting is that the Holy Spirit, the one that what? Leads us into all truth, comes to us on the day that the law, which led them into all truth, was given to them. You see, God never does anything without a reason. Now, sometimes, and this is just, just super true, sometimes he doesn't tell us the reason, though. A lot of the times he does. But sometimes there's things that he does in the Bible that I don't understand. And I know he's righteous, he's holy, but I don't understand why he did it that way. I respect him. I know, hey, he's got, he's got a plan. And maybe in the future, maybe it will make sense in the scheme of the world, politics, culture, whatever. Maybe eventually it will make sense. It just may not make sense to us right now. However, sometimes God reveals why he does things. Sometimes he doesn't. 
And so we see that this one he does. When God gave Moses instructions in how to live in the people of Israel, the same celebration was when the Holy Spirit comes into us, giving us instruction in how to live, convicting of us of sin, being our helper. And we see that in verse six. So when they had come together, they asked him, the Lord, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, there is so many nuggets of stuff in this small bit of scripture. Because what's interesting is sometimes in narratives, it's a little harder to see a few things because it's just some people talking. But sometimes it's good when you're studying the Bible specifically, if God and a man or an angel, sometimes angels talk to mankind or, or Jesus and a man, or the Holy Spirit even interacting with man. Sometimes in those conversations, you need to stop reading and think about what did they ask and was it actually answered? Jesus almost never answers them in exactly the way that they're expecting. You know, Jesus, when we resurrect, will we be married? There was a man on the side of the road. And you're like, where does he do it? I don't even know. There was a man on the side of the road. And he was walking down the road. And he'll just go off into this tangent, okay? That's why I feel like I'm preaching right. You know what I mean? Okay? Anyway, but he will do all of this stuff. And yet, look at what they ask. They ask him. But this is a legit question. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Even after the resurrection, Jesus has been with them for 40 days now. In 10 days from this moment, the Holy Spirit's going to come. Because he's uh, lifted up and ascended to the right hand of God. Daniel chapter 7, at the end of these verses, okay? But right before this, he spent 40 days with them. He has been resurrected. They should start getting the idea. But here's the thing. To an Israelite, the idea of Jesus winning the world is very different from the way we think about it. Now, eventually they understood it. But see, what the Israelites thought was that the Messiah, whoever he was, now they know it's Jesus. They believe the Messiah, being Jesus now, was going to come out of the heavens and he was going to start shooting lightning at Rome and literally taking over the physical world. Taking it over, okay? They thought he was going to set up a kingdom or heaven was going to come down. It's fuzzy even if you ask a rabbi in today's time. I asked a rabbi about this one time and he gave me all kind of variables. Like, well, it could be this, could be that, could be this, could be that. They still do not have a real good way of understanding this if you don't believe in Jesus, okay? A Hasidic Jew, a non-Messianic Jew. But they believe somehow the Messiah is going to come down and he's going to take over, at this point, Rome. In today's time, it would be like the, the whole, all government would be under him, okay? Well, his disciples still thought that. Well, at this time, Jesus... Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That is their number one focus. Now, the Messiah being saved, all that's good. However, with salvation, they're like, well, you still have to do this thing. You know, you said you would be a king like David, and David took over everything, and so you have to take over everything. That's really where they get that concept from. He's going to be a king in the lineage of David. David took over the known world. The Messiah must take over the whole world. But here's the thing. It never says that. It just says he will be a king like David. Do you know what that tells you? He's going to be a king. You know, like David. <laughs> but they take it and they run with it. 
And that's still to this day what they think. The disciples still thought about that. And look what he says. And he realizes that this guy got it. It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. But, this is a good but. Because here's, listen to what he's saying. They're asking him, when are you going to take over the world? And he answers them. But he doesn't answer them in any way that a first century Jewish person would have understood until later on we actually realize when the Holy Spirit comes, it does what? What it was one of the attributes? He teaches us all things. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up and starts preaching. And this finally makes sense. And Peter preaches it in chapter 3. It's going to be fun. But look at this. When will you restore the kingdom to Israel? It's not for you to know that specific time. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to all the earth. Here's the thing. You know what's bigger than Rome? All the earth. You know what's bigger than Rome? Judea and Samaria were a part of Rome. So in a way, he is going to take over, but not in the way they were expecting. But guess who he puts all of the emphasis back on? Jesus. Will you at this time restore the kingdom? Jesus says, no. You will receive power. You will receive power. And you will be my witnesses. To Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So guess what Jesus is showing them? Who are the people that's going to take over the world? The disciples. By extension, the church. Who's a part of the church? We are a part of the church. Jesus is in an indirect way telling them, I'm not taking over the world, at least in the way you think. You're going to take it over. You, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses. You're going to do it all, my disciples. I really can't believe you haven't figured that out yet. Hey, let's start going through some of those maps. The first map. I want to show you visually what's going on. You will be my witnesses to Jerusalem. Next map. Judea is the bottom red circle. And the kingdom was split in half by Samaria. The top ones, the bad guys, the Gentiles. All of us are Samaritans to a Jewish person. Go to the next one. To the ends of the earth, the Roman Empire, this covers, I mean, a little bit up, it was a weird circle, I couldn't make it, but basically this was the Roman Empire in their time. That was the first century, everywhere you see on this map, in the first century, the first 100 years of time, 33 Jesus was here, okay? 60-something years of time, everyone in this map had somehow heard about Jesus. Go to the next map. That red circle is the same proportion. The purple circle was the second century. Everyone in that purple circle had heard about Christ in some way by the second century. Go to the next map. Jerusalem is 6,660 miles away from us. From Gothenburg. That is map quested to Gothenburg to Jerusalem. Turns out you can't drive that far. But 6,660 miles away, and we are talking about Jesus. We're talking about him, what he did, and guess what? We're talking about the disciples who were given the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses. From Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know what? 
Way over here in Gothenburg, Nebraska, those disciples didn't know Gothenburg, Nebraska existed. As people spread out to the ends of the earth, became more and more big. And we are one city. You've heard me say this a few times. We are one city in one county in one state in one country on one continent on the other side of the world. And we're talking about this story. So, is the church taking over? Absolutely. Absolutely. He said, well, what about all the politics, all that stuff? You forgot what I said earlier. Every knee yes. will bow. Now, what he doesn't say is when they will bow. It could be what Lord, Pastor Blake, when is Jesus coming back? It could be another 5,000 years from now. It honestly could. What you are seeing in culture and politics really happens a lot around the world for the last decade, a few decades. We're not even under persecution. We are in the lightest possible persecution that you could be in. Okay? There's all around the world Christian suffering. It could be a long, long time before Christ comes back. But I do know one thing. Christ is winning. We are winning. Are there others that need to be won? Absolutely. Can it seem bleak at times? You ever heard of Nero and his persecutions? Things done to Christians, you can't imagine the, the evil and the wickedness. And yet, we're living in a free country where we're all gathered together. Everyone in our town knows where we're at and we're just raising our hands and it's all fine. We're not in China in an underground church that's being hidden. We're not in Iraq where the church is growing hundreds of thousands of folds. We're not there. But the church is winning. Let's pray today. Lord, thank you, Father, for your work. Thank you, Lord, Father. Lord, that we see victory. Yet we can also see trials. Lord, and I pray, Father, for anyone in here that may be anxious or weary of doing good and whatever it could be, Father. Lord, I pray, Father, that if there's persecution to come, that we would be resilient and ready. But where sin abounds, grace abounds more. In the midst of persecution, churches explode. Lord, we pray that we are empowered and ready and able to see the work that you have ready to be done. Lord, we do not leave this place waiting to be rescued. We leave this place with a mission to go rescue people from the grave. We go out knowing we have been empowered by your spirit. All that we may need to fill up again. But we are empowered by what you have done. And we are your witnesses. Thank you, Father, that we can come to you in our prayers. Thank you, Father, that we can come to you in our sin and our trespass, and, and yet you give us new life. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I hope you're ready for Acts. We're going to see some mighty, mighty things that we're going to notice in the book. And uh, we didn't get through chapter one. We will continue uh, uh, to go through it. I'm going to expound upon us taking over the world and exactly how that works, how we can help in that illustration uh, next week. And then we'll keep going through it, but be praying, be seeking God, and uh, be filled with the Spirit. Have a good week.